Hey, it's Nathan, and these are the things that I want to talk about today. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some stuff, and we'll do a we'll do an update next week. So let's say you have some process on a set that you're interested in, and as you iterate that process on your set, you notice that your set gets closer and closer to some object that you're familiar with. The problem with saying close to is that it's not really clear what close to means when you're talking about sets. And so it's a non-trivial question to ask, what does close to mean? This is actually a problem that comes up all over the place, from computer science to bioinformatorics, uh, bio, bioinform, bioinformatics, and other places like fractal geometry. So to start, let's go ahead and just talk about the case of one point instead of a whole set of points. Usually when you're thinking about dynamics, you're thinking about some continuous transformation operating on that point. So to make things easier for us, we're just gonna focus on the plane or R2 and functions that go from R2 to R2. As we iterate this continuous function on our point, we're going to get something called the orbit of our point under the map F. And that's just the list of all iterates of F on our point X. If F is invertible, we can go ahead and go backwards as well. So orbits might contain pre-images, they might not. It depends on how you want to define things. If we want to figure out what this orbit attracts to, we just take the limit as n goes to infinity of the map applied n times to X. And we see how that limit evaluates by using Euclidean distance. And when I say Euclidean distance, I just mean the normal way that we think about distances between two points, the shortest straight line path between those two points, whatever the length of that line segment between the two is, that is Euclidean distance. But this doesn't work for sets of points because you've got multiple points that you're working with. So how do we go ahead and formalize this sort of idea of distance to sets. In order to make sure things stay nice, we're gonna go ahead and focus on particular types of sets, the compact ones, which for us just mean that the set is closed and bounded. So the closed part of that just means that whatever set we take is going to be equal to the union of its interior and its boundary. So in other words, the set that we're interested in is going to have all of its boundary points as a part of the set. And then the bounded part of that is that there exists some real number, big M, such that we can put a disk of radius, big M, around our set and contain all of it within that disk of radius, big M. These properties are gonna make it really easy to talk about expanding a set by a certain constant, which we'll call delta. And so to look at an example of expanding a set by delta, what we can go ahead and do is we can go ahead and look at all of the points in our set A and figure out what other points in the plane are not included in A that are at least less than or equal to delta away from another point in A. This will give us another set which we'll call a delta, which is sort of like A, it just has a perimeter around it that is delta farther out. Uh, intuitively, that is. It might not always be the case that A delta has a boundary that looks exactly like A, but that's beside the point. The first thing to notice about these A delta sets is that we actually don't need to expand a set in order to contain itself. That being, uh, every set is a subset of itself. So it seems like a good candidate to say that the distance between two sets that are the same is just zero if we think about how much we need to expand them in order to contain themselves. This idea of how much we need to expand a given set in order to contain another is going to be the main motivation for defining what Hausdorff distance is or what the distance between two sets of points is. So if we go ahead and look at two different compact sets, A and B, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and try to expand A and B by some delta, which is going to be the same for A and B, such that A delta, the expansion of A by delta, is going to contain B, and B delta, the expansion of B by delta, 
contains A. We know we can do this because our compact sets are bounded, so we always know that there are, is going to be some delta that's going to be large enough that we can capture the other set. Now, after we've done that and found a delta that works, the next question is, well, can we get the best delta? So the second step in this distance finding process is to shrink delta to be as small as you possibly can make it. So if you wanna be more mathematical about it, we're gonna take the infimum of all of these delta such that A delta contains B and B delta contains A. This is what is going to define Hausdorff distance for us. So the Hausdorff distance between two sets a and B denoted D sub H of A and B is going to be equal to the infimum of all delta such that A delta contains B and B delta contains A. Showing that Hausdorff distance fits the properties of a metric when working with compact sets is actually a pretty good exercise and it's I think it's pretty fun because there's some weirdness that happens with the triangle inequality. But the first three properties are actually pretty intuitive. So First off, the distance is always going to be greater than zero for any two sets of points because we're never contracting a set. We're always expanding it to contain the other and the same with the other set that's considered in the distance. So the second metric property that the Hausdorff distance between A and B is equal to zero if and only if A is equal to B is something that we've already touched on at least in one direction. And that is you don't need to expand a set to capture the other set if the other set is just the set that you're trying to expand, which is was very wordy, I, I, but essentially that's the intuition for it, is that if you take a set and you don't have to expand it to contain the other set, then the set you started with must be equal to the set that you're trying to contain. That didn't help. That was still like super wordy, but we're gonna go with it. And then the third property just falls out of the definition. That is, the distance function is symmetric. So the Hausdorff distance between A and B is the same as taking the Hausdorff distance between B and A. And we get this because in the definition of Hausdorff distance, we have the infimum of delta such that A delta contains B and B delta contains A. When you switch around the sets, you just switch around the statements in the and, which is an equivalent statement. So that is why the third property works. So the fourth property, the triangle inequality, that is that the Hausdorff distance between A and C is going to be less than or equal to the Hausdorff distance between A and B plus the Hausdorff distance between B and C. That one, I'm not gonna spoil. I already mentioned that I think it's a pretty fun and cool exercise. And if you're interested in this stuff, it's something that it probably helped to think about to build your understanding of what this distance actually calculates. Uh, so I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to leave that for you if you want to think about it. But anyway, yeah, the cool thing about getting a metric out of this is that we can start to talk about sequences of sets and it makes the limit as you apply a function over and over again to a particular set equaling to another set makes sense because we can then define that limit using the Hausdorff distance instead of the Euclidean distance. That is, for a given epsilon greater than zero, there exists a big N within the natural numbers such that for every little n that is, or little k, I guess is what I wrote on the board, that is greater than or equal to big N, the Hausdorff distance between the kth iterate of the function applied to A and your supposed limit set is going to be less than epsilon. And so essentially what that means is that we can make the distance between these sets as small as we want, as long as we just apply the function as, uh, so many times. And this is exactly the type of process that allows us to define things like Sierpinski's carpet or Barnsley's fern without any mathematical ambiguity, because we can say that these types of sets are attractors of some process. So yeah, with that, I think that's all I wanted to talk about today. Filming wise, this is the shortest it's ever taken me to film a video, which is cool. But also um, <laughs> it's been the longest I've gone without posting for a while, um, which I sort of mentioned at the beginning in editing. Grad school has been hectic, so it's going. I'm doing, I'm doing fine. I think I'm doing okay. We'll see. But 
I'll do an update on that sometime in the future. If you did enjoy this and want to see more stuff like this, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics content. And as always, I'm Nathan. This was chalk for once in a long while, which is kind of cool. And I will see you next time.